Okay, so um, I need to add a little bit more on this um, uh, out of this lecture notes number six, PDF number six on uh, the slant stack, on PTAU, on the radon transform, and then we can move along to what you've all been waiting for. Okay, um, so uh, um, everybody was able to get the new um, PDF number uh, eight. Because that's where we're going, okay? And I'll explain how. All right. So um, we have ended up. Um, let's see. Let me uh, review some key points here. We have looked at three integrals, okay? There's the forward radon transform here, um, which you can see is basically a slant stack, just expressed as a continuous. Um, Integration in the uh, from the it's an integration across the uh, x and t domain, and it's into the p and tau domain. Um, and uh, that's a generalization of the uh, the slant stack down below is a gen and, or p tau is a generalization of the radon transform, which is expressed in whatever domains you want x and y, a and b. Um, any any 2D domains. Um, I have not seen any looks into um, 3D um, types of radon transforms. You would think that you could take a central slice of a 3D Fourier transformed um, data volume, or you could take a you could integrate over a plane um, set through uh, some three-dimensional scalar field. Haven't seen anybody try that uh, and see what you could get, but in these days of um, you know 4D um, data X Y Z and and uh, not time on the seismic record, but uh, looking at differences between surveys taken in different epochs, um, you'd think you you'd need to start integrating over planes, integrating over volumes, integrating over four dimensions uh, tesseracts. Uh, because our the dimensions of our data sets are just growing, you know. Every every five years or so, we add a new dimension. So uh, we need to uh, broaden what we can consider. All right, and then we divide we derive the second integral uh, here expressed continuously, but we know how to do it as a summation in the discrete. Um, Omega and discrete k domains as well. Um, so this gets uh, this integral here, get uh, which is really just a, an inverse uh, Fourier transform from omega to tau. It gets us a um, uh, that that uh, integral gets us the trace at one constant p for all tau um, of um, uh, the slant stack. Okay, so that's what's on the left. P bar is the slant stack. Uh, the P tau transform of uh, the wave field in uh, in X and T, which is first transformed to K and omega, and then taking the central slice along omega and P, omega times P, um, and uh, taking that one D. You know, the central slice is a one D vector, uh, and then uh, doing the uh, Inverse Fourier transform of that vector from omega to, to tau gets us one trace at one p. Okay. Now then, having that Fourier representation of the um, of the p tau transform, then Thorson was able to derive this uh, uh, Fourier this uh, inverse. Excuse me, it's not a Fourier representation. He derived via a the Fourier representation. Um, he derived the inverse slant stack. Okay, and and this is not a great way of expressing it. I, I, um, you know, there's really two integrals here, um, uh, or two series of integrals. Um, what you've got here is is the inverse slant stack as it's usually used, uh, which is actually, as we'll find out later, it's a it's the conjugate to the slant stack. Get the uh, um, the transpose of the slant stack. 
no, I'm sorry, the adjoint uh, to the uh, trans uh, to the slant stack, uh, which is uh, the transpose of the slant stack. So when we express the slant, you know, we remember how we express the um, um, we could express the NMO um, uh, correction as a uh, matrix multiplication. We can also express the um, slant stack and the uh, adjoint trans slant stack as a um, uh, a linear uh, matrix multiplication. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's what this integral is. You can see that it's extremely similar to the uh, forward slant stack. Just change the sign in here, uh, assuming that uh, and take p and tau as the input instead of x and t. All right. Um, and the strange thing about this equation is there's this time domain filter that's um, added as a uh, as a convolution. So uh, you take that uh, uh, omega as the um, um, absolute value of omega frequency domain uh, filter, and uh, you know that's just scaling the Fourier transform components, you know, by zero at uh, zero frequency. And by a hundred at a hundred at a uh, hundred uh, uh, radians per second. <laughs> okay, um, and um, so it's a high-pass filter here, represented in the um, uh, in the time domain. You know, you can take that filter and using all the any of the methods that we discussed in uh, seven oh six, you could uh, inverse transform that filter into the time domain, and then convolve it. That's what this star is, if you remember from 706. Convolve it with the output uh, trace by trace uh, of, the, uh, of the new you know, inverse transform data field in X and T. All right. Later on, I will show you, uh, after we talk about uh, Kirchhoff migration, I will show you uh, examples of inverse, trans inverse P tau transforms when I talk about um, uh, signal and noise separation, um, which I think is a very uh, key and useful topic. Um, so I will get to it. OK, so um, uh, you know, there's the, the recipe. Change the sign in our time domain slant stacker and convolve with a time domain filter. Uh, the row filter uh, boosts the uh, higher frequencies to make up for the enhancement of the low frequencies during an integration. And now, now this notice that uh, uh, if you do things the way electrical engineers do and mathematicians, um, you know there ought to be a scale factor here uh, in the in the forward slant stack. You ought to have a um, uh, like. Like here in the in the forward slant stack, you ought to have a row, uh, half of the row filter, you know, uh, omega square root of omega um, uh, fil row filter ought to uh, apply to uh, the forward slant stack. Um, there should also be scale factors here, so that we don't uh, you know lose or gain energy. All right, none of that is shown by uh, by Clairbout. And in fact, uh, what Clairbout usually does that you ought to, you got to be aware of, you know, when you try to take his uh, um, his equations out into the real world, um, you know, out in the real world, uh, people tend to apply the scale factors and they apply the row filter. Uh, you know, if they're trying to do things correctly, they apply all those in the forward direction, and they also apply them in the inverse direction. To keep things simple in the Fourier domain, Clairbout only applies them on the inverse. So his uh, uh, his Fourier transforms, uh, you know, his equations are slightly different in that way from everybody else's, and uh, that's something you've got to observe about the, this Clairbout and Thorsen expression of the uh, of the slant stack. It's uh, everything: the scale factors, the row filter. It's applied uh, in the um, it's applied in the in the inverse only, okay, and it has to be applied double uh, as much as everybody else does. So, uh, little warning there. 
uh, okay, here's the row filter uh, in the frequency domain, right? You've got a mute um, negative frequency symmetrically with the positive frequencies. And you take this sort of inverse triangle and you uh, transform it to the time domain, and you're going to have some kind of sync function. And it's a you know it's a messy long lived function, right? You got to you got to keep the sync function at least as long as your data when you convolve it, and that adds uh, that adds a little computational load because um, the sync function just does not die away very fast. Okay, what do we get? Uh, out of slant stacking. We now have a way to sort out all the different constant p, constant slowness, constant apparent velocity components of a wave field. Okay? Uh, and I just gave you, you know, three different terms for the uh, uh, you know, constant ray components of a wave field. So you know, every wave field that you have except for a, a, you know, a plane wave is the only, um, is the only kind of uh, wave field, a pure plane wave is the only wave field that has absolutely constant p, constant slowness. Any real wave field you see is just full of different, different plane waves in different directions and different frequencies, of course. And, and so now we have a way of sorting out, in whatever complex wave field we have, we can sort out its different Velocities of propagation. It's different apparent velocities. It's different. It's different um, um, uh, slownesses. You know, just as easily as the Fourier transform sorts out different frequencies in that wave field. All right, we can do it in the physical domain. We can do it in the Fourier domain. Okay, and we also know that the process is linear. In other words, you add together two inputs. And then uh, Fourier transform the sum. It's the same. You get the same thing precisely as Fourier transforming um, the uh, uh, each input and summing in the Fourier in the slant stack domain. Okay, it's all linear. It's all invertible. All right. Um, so uh, one place that a slant stack decomposition into constant P constant slowness components, constant apparent velocity components can really help us is in the analysis of refracted arrivals. Now you might know that uh, if you have a um, uh, velocity that increases linearly with depth, okay, if you have a linear increase of in velocity with depth, uh, and you shoot out some some rays in, and into some um, uh, into some uh, uh, receivers that are uh, uh, at a distance, the uh, uh, the linear velocity function assures you that um, uh, that the rays will take circular paths. Okay, there'll be uh, uh, chords of a circle. Each ray will be a chord of a circle. Okay, and uh, uh, now what do I mean by a ray? Let's let's think about that. Okay. Um, basically, a ray is a is a seismological concept. It's supposed to follow a packet of energy along a path. And uh, what defines that path? Well, what defines that path is the slowness of that packet of energy. The uh, and, and it's a horizontal slowness, by the way. Uh, the horizontal apparent velocity is the same for every part of each ray. Okay, everywhere along this ray, the horizontal slowness is the same. Okay, I'm sorry. The the um, yeah um, the horizontal slowness is the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the uh, uh, um, uh, and I, I'd like you to notice that at the bottom of each of these rays, these refracted rays. Okay, the ray is, is uh, propagating horizontally. Okay, which means that the horizontal slowness is equal to the true slowness, or the the ray parameter p is equal to the actual velocity at this point at the bottom of the ray. Okay. So so each of these refracted arrivals, as you might have suspected, is giving you some information about velocity. And that velocity information is true definitely 
at the uh, uh, at the very bottom of the ray, wherever that is. Uh, but uh, as you might expect, it's averaging. If there are lateral velocity contrasts, if it's not just v as a function of z, then we're essentially, you know, averaging that velocity information across the whole ray, which is really averaging. You know, so the the seismic refraction survey like this is averaging the velocity information um, along the whole path. Okay. That's why the uh, uh, it's it's constant horizontal slowness. That's what p is. Okay, the horizontal component of slowness is is constant. Okay, so over here where the true velocity is less up high, it has it doesn't travel as far horizontally. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. All right. Um, so according to Snell's law. The ray has to bend, right? Velocity changes, the ray bends to keep the horizontal slowness equal. Yeah. Um, this is this is uh, this is basic seismological stuff, earthquake seismology, that us uh, exploration seismologists tend to ignore. You know, we don't need stuff this much. Okay, but. Uh, uh, you know, as as the earthquake seismologists will tell us, we gotta we gotta think about it sometimes. Just usually think of isotropic velocity models. Right, right. Um, well, but but you know, velocity uh, very often um, increases with depth in in some uh, you know bizarre way. Uh, so I want to show you just a uh, a couple minutes of number seven because it starts here. Okay. So uh, uh, the concept behind uh, this um, uh, let's see this paper by a couple of papers by uh, Clayton and McMechan. Um, McMechan is uh, still teaching at uh, University of Texas at Dallas. He's probably graduated. Uh, uh, 25 PhD students. Clayton is still teaching at uh, Caltech, and uh, he's probably graduated uh, 15 or 20 PhD students. Um, you know, additional uh, additional um, uh, Clairbout academic uh, grandchildren. Um, uh, Clayton was my advisor, um, so I found this paper uh, very interesting. And it's probably uh, it's probably the one that got Clayton his job at Caltech, if I have to say. So let's take an exploding reflector view uh, of earthquake seismology. All right, um, or refraction seismology. So we um, we uh, uh, you know we have this uh, refracted ray that comes down, turns around, turns into a refraction, is propagating horizontally. And we're still under this assumption that, that there's no lateral velocity variation. And it eventually bends up into a head wave and comes back to a receiver. Okay. Now, the, most of the refraction paths that you're used to are, um, you know, they're trapezoidal. Um, but this one is uh, just approximated as, uh, as circular. Okay. Because we're not relying on there now, we're not relying on there being any... Um, any interfaces. We can have a gradient in velocity, right, and still get a refraction. Okay. So there's H. You know, you got a midpoint. There's H. You can take the exploding reflector model and say, all right, the reflector, the refractor, excuse me, it's an exploding refractor model. The refractor explodes at time zero and prop, you know, you divide the velocity, whatever it is, at whatever depth by uh, two, and it's going to take this semicircular, this uh, quarter circle. Uh, uh, perhaps path back up to the receiver. Okay, so so you accumulate the travel time uh, uh, from the bottoming point of the ray, where it's horizontal. It's horizontal at the bottoming point by definition, and uh, there can only be one bottoming point. Uh, if we can find the depth where the ray bottoms, then the inverse of p there will be the true velocity at that depth. So we could actually use um, we could actually use uh, you know the slant stack, 
can isolate the energy from that um, um, from that ray that's traveling at a p. So we know what p is, and if we can find if we can downward continue uh, to zero time and find that that bottoming ray, then we know the velocity there at that depth. Okay. So uh, uh, and we just have to uh, downward continue to back to t equals zero. You know, we divide the the velocity by two. Okay, so that's what uh, Clayton and McMechan implemented in um, in this um, on these two papers, uh, and they um, they analyzed some uh, refraction data from the Imperial Valley. Um, you both have heard about the Salton Sea um, uh, seismic uh, study that that's been done over the last couple of years. And this is the study done by the USGS before that, you know, 30 years before. All right. So uh, all stuff you know here, uh, add in the slant stack. This is a downward continuation of the slant stack. Here's the, uh, here's the procedure. Uh, nothing, nothing new. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a slant stack synthetic record. And here is, um, here is the um, the downward continued slant stack, and notice we're we're we got here labeled the uh, um, the nonlinear velocity scale, the linear p scale, uh, with velocity increasing to the right, and this is uh, now you know we we're, we've down, downward continued and transformed from time to z, so that's depth in in kilometers, and the energy is landing along a curve. Once you correct for the 270 degree uh, phase difference, this is why I know about that that 270 degree uh, phase change that uh, head waves have. Okay, um, it's out of this paper. Uh, then the um, the the refracted energy lands right along the um, right along the uh, um, the velocity. Uh, um, uh, the velocity uh, um, uh, path, the, the VZ path. They did it for Imperial Valley, so there's a real refraction record there. It's unreversed because if, if you have exact horizontal, um, uh, exact horizontal um, uh, homogene homo homogeneity, okay, you don't even need to reverse your refraction profiles, right? One does it, um, and uh, there's the slant stack of the of the data, and there's the downward continued slant stack showing the uh, um, the velocity versus depth function. Uh, again, on a nonlinear velocity and linear p scale. Uh, the take home message, and and this is still a very important message here, is. Um, the huge velocity gradient, you know, going from uh, uh, sediments that are below two kilometers per second p wave velocity at the surface in the in the Salton trough, uh, rapidly increasing to two kilometers depth, which that happens in a lot of places uh, uh, just due to closing cracks, but then it's the rest of this gradient that really amazed everybody. And that this technique actually was able to get, and, and other techniques are not able to get. Um, so the gradient up to three point five, I mean that's that's getting pretty high, but uh, but not uh, not outrageous. But then the further gradient at only uh, five kilometers depth is that right, or is that six? Anyway, only at five or six kilometers depth, all the way up to five and a half kilometers per second. You know, everybody thought, all right, they're going to hit the basalts. It's going to be six kilometers per second sharply. And this demonstrated that it's not a sharp transition at all. It's gradual. It's a gradient in velocity. And what that proved was, uh, and everybody suddenly realized, oh, this is what you get when you, when you put a, the Colorado River deltaic sediments on top of an active oceanic spreading center, which is the case in Imperial Valley. And um, so that was uh, that was an, an, an amazing take-home message from uh, uh, that um, uh, that survey. Okay. So we're basically skipping over 
uh, number seven. Let's go to number eight. All right. So we're in uh, in number eight now. And we've we've added several tools to our toolbox. We have a deeper understanding now about multi-offset data. Uh, we have a much deeper understanding now about what NMO correction and stacking really does. Um, we, uh, um, we, I, I will also show you later on um, the, uh, the pre-stack uh, Fourier domain migrations and the pre-stack uh, um, AVO inversions, okay, for, you know, trying to separate uh, K and, uh, uh, in other words, uh, uh, well, velocity from density properties of uh, that affect reflectivity. Um, but um, those uh, uh, we've ad we've added more tools to our toolbox. Uh, we still have several more. Um, but those uh, uh, Fourier domain uh, migrations are not used much. Okay. So before this class goes on too far, I've got to get to the the migrations that that everybody uses. Okay. And what I'm showing you is, is some very early work of mine. I think it still applies. Um, and it has certainly been part of what's inspired uh, uh, many, many other people to go on and, uh, and further develop this uh, subject of, of Kirchhoff migration. So, um, and really what I mean here by Kirchhoff migration is um, pre-stack um, migration, okay? Uh, so uh, you've probably heard about PSTM and PSDM, okay? That's the modern terminology. It didn't exist when I, when I wrote these notes. Uh, I'm sorry to say uh, that the notes are so old. Um, the uh, uh, first of what we're going to cover is multi-offset 3D pre-stack time migration, okay? Uh, and and uh, as we learned in 706, the difference between time migration and depth migration is that for time migration, we don't have to have resolved um, all of the lateral velocity changes, okay? We don't, you know, we, we've, we do we work on velocity. We do NMO. Um, we uh, uh, we might do this uh, um, this refraction uh, downward continuation and learn about. We might learn a lot about velocity as a function of depth. Um, but we're at the stage of the project where we want to get an image. We want to get an image in three dimensions. We want to get an image directly from from pre-stack data. Okay, because. We don't simultaneously have zero dip and uh, and zero offset. All right, so um, we want to uh, we want to do all those things, but we're not quite there with velocity. Okay, uh, and in fact, most of the so-called uh, you know, if you go out and, and bid seismic processing right now, you'll get a raft of bids in um, from. Um, uh, from processors who will claim that they're going to give you PSDM, pre-stack depth migration. And if you look carefully at their bids, and if you examine their, uh, their products, and if you talk to their, their customers, you're going to find out that they're not going to do the necessary work to define um, the lateral changes in velocity. Now, that works fine in Texas, okay? But in Wyoming, in Nevada, um, in, uh, in many other places, it doesn't work. Okay? And your, your, your pre-stack time migrations 
you know, you claim to be doing pre-stack depth migrations, but they're really pre-stack depth migrations. I'm sorry. You claim to be you claim to be doing pre-stack depth migrations, but they're really pre-stack time migrations because the processor has not put in the effort to assess lateral velocity variations. They might not even know how. Okay. Uh, and they're, but they're selling you a bill of goods because they're charging you extra for PSDM and they're not delivering. And, and you're, contra you're probably contrasting it with a higher bid from a company that is really doing pre PSDM, okay, pre-stack depth migration, and they're having to charge you for that extra effort. And so they lose the job to most, you know, to most, uh, 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 to most companies. All right, so it's kind of a racket right now of uh, processors who claim to be doing PSDM but are really not. And, um, uh, you know, we'll see if, if I have any influence over that in the next uh, umpteen years. All right, so we're going to start with, with PSTM. Velocity is a function of, of depth only. Okay, at least strongly. All right. So, uh, all right, as, as we do, let's start with, with constant velocity. And I've got to uh, get this on the correct kind of... Uh, there we go. Okay. Let's recall the impulse response of migration to a point arrival in the zero offset section. Okay, so now we know our, our data are m. In a zero offset section, our axes are midpoint m and zero offset time tau. We know that now. We our our data, let's say, is zero everywhere except at one point, at one pair of m and tau, and we do a zero offset migration, which we defined in 706. We can do it many ways, and uh, in fact, we did it. Uh, in, in your um, uh, Stolt migration exercise, probably lab six, um, and uh, each of those points becomes a semicircle. Okay, I'm sure you remember that. Uh, and, and now your, your model, okay, your data domain was m and tau, your model domain is m and z. Okay? And at the bottom of that, of that semicircle is the point m, the same midpoint, uh, and it's now been projected from tau to z. Okay. Now, what is that semicircle? That semicircle is a surface that includes all possible reflection points that may place an arrival at that point in the data, at m and tau. And and of course, uh, you know, since uh, at least until uh, 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 Annie looked at the uh, the Hawthorne three D uh, data set. Um, we didn't think that there were very many uh, true dish-shaped semicircle reflectors out there. Okay, uh, so really, you know, we expected that, uh, you know, we wouldn't have one point in the data. We would have a whole series of points, and these semicircles would all uh, line up along the uh, uh, the structure that uh, that is there. That is not a semicircle. And the arms of the semicircle probably would be canceled out after you add enough data. In. Okay. So in in three dimensions, okay. Again, let's think about uh, still about zero offset data. All right. Let's find the impulse response of a point arrival in a in a three D zero offset data set. Okay. So maybe this is a three D uh, chirp survey. Okay. Uh, and we so. Our, our point arrival, you know, with everything else zero, our impulse is at some x, you know, maybe that's easting, y, maybe that's northing, and tau, again, zero offset time, okay? And what is, what is that going to, you know, that's at h equal to zero. We migrate that. That turns into a hemisphere, okay? With the center of the sphere at the surface point x, y, and the lowest point of the sphere at uh, x, y, and some z that gets transformed from tau, but the same x and y. Okay. How does the amplitude get distributed on that in the sphere? 
Uh, see, see, uh, we're um, we're we're not tracking it very well. Okay, I, I'm talking here about uh, you know ray equations, which assumes infinite frequency, and an inf infinite frequency. How much energy do you have? Um, why not zero energy? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. So uh, if you uh, uh, if you uh, integrate a uh, um, you're talking about an infinite delta function spike. Well, you integrate that, and you you'll find you know um, limited uh, lim you know a, a finite amount of energy. Okay, but um, is there ever is there ever you know, in the physical world, at infinite frequency, is there any energy? No. I mean, I, you know, I can't get, I can't even get 200 hertz into the ground, okay? And, and uh, 200 hertz, you know, even in this, in this context is, uh, you know, far away from the, the equations that are defining that, that semicircle, okay? So there's the, there's the first problem with trying to de decide um, um, about the amplitude. OK, now, according to our infinite frequency ray equations, as implemented in, say, Stolt migration, how is the amplitude of that, of that spot, how is that spread over this, uh, this semicircle or, or, by extension, this uh, um, this uh, uh, hemisphere. Totally, totally, totally right. And and why is that? Uh, that's true. I mean that that all depends on how we get that zero offset data, right? If we stack it, then that's the dip filter right there. But even let's say we have perfect, beautiful, maybe synthetic. Zero offset data, okay, and we and and we we go ahead and we assume that uh, uh, that we don't have to be at infinite uh, frequency, and we go ahead and migrate it using all the equations that you're used to. What determines the velocity, the the amplitude distribution on that semicircle or the hemisphere? Remember the the obliquity factor? No. And, and the obliquity factor was derived from what? Just the, the Jacobian of the substitution, right? So, so it's kind of simple and geometric, right? Um, so it, it, it doesn't really come from the physics of the wave, okay? But it is saying, yes, you know, the obliquity factor alone is going gonna, is gonna to concentrate energy on the bottom of the semicircle according to that cosine theta, right? Theta is zero. The you know the the uh, amplitude of the obliquity factor is one at the bottom. It's one at the bottom of the hemisphere. You get up to the uh, surface, and the it's cosine of ninety degrees, so that's that's zero. Okay. Um, but uh, that doesn't you know. It, it comes from a derivation that's too far from the physics. Okay. Um, and so it's it's if we uh, um, if we ex we're, we're going to use it we're going to do it and we're going to look at amplitudes but what I'm warning you is not to expect too much okay and and actually you know I'm making the same warning that that Graham is a lot you know you don't really know anything until you do the full wave inversion one way or another okay it's the full wave inversion that will tell you how much amplitude really lands on some structure you know and that's after you've yeah, you've got all the velocity you know all taken care of that's the full wave propagation i mean that will appropriately handle the amplitude okay noise, of course of course uh, yeah, it's got all, you know, um, yeah, that's why we don't, yeah, that's why we haven't been able to use it yet for land data. 
you know, I think he could be right. I mean, it's it's time to start trying, you know. Um, that's why that's why I'm hoping that you guys will both be able to, you know, later when you've reached the right stage, right? Yeah. You all know what that is. Okay. Okay. Now. Here's the key, and uh, and uh, I'm going to try to get this point across, and then we'll have to quit until next week. All right. The response of multi-offset migration to a point arrival in a multi-offset section. So here is but one CMP gather. Okay, and in the in and and there are other CMP gathers, but they they all have zero data. The, the, there's no there's no arrivals on on any of them. Here's that one lonely CMP gather out of the whole survey that that uh, got one arrival. I suppose if if I ever recorded a data like data set like that, uh, I would be a genius and I'd get fired in the same week. I mean, it just you know, it just can't happen, right? <laughs> but if I you know if that was a valid data set, it would be incredibly significant. Um. So, uh, uh, so in that one lonely CMP gather out of the whole data set, you know, and, the, and of course its axes are H and T, okay, there is, it's zero everywhere but at one point. And, uh, and that point has some amplitude uh, at, at some H and T, okay? And then here's, um, I think I might have forgotten to put the one half in there. Um, you know, that's, that's just H in terms of G and S. Um, Here's the cross section in the model domain, data domain, model domain on the right, okay, uh, and the cross section is in X and Z. There's the source point, there's the receiver point, okay, and the locus of all points that could contribute to this impulse at H and T is a um, uh, is an ellipse. In constant velocity, it's it's exactly an ellipse, and uh, that's the locus of all points for which the path from the uh, from the source <clears throat> to bounce, you know, at a reflection angle off the ellipse and go back to the receiver G. Okay, the total length of that path is the same, and then you take the total length of that path and divide by the velocity, and you get you always get no matter you know. Which part of the ellipse you're bouncing off, you get the time t. Okay, so you know with small time, the ellipse is tightly around s and g. With large time, the ellipse, you know, at a very large time, you know, s and g are close relative to the size of the ellipse, so it looks more like a semicircle. All right. <clears throat> All right. So that ellipse locates all points where a over v plus b over v is equal to t, the total travel time. Okay, and uh, if you remember anything about ellipses from elementary school, you might realize that s and g are the foci of the ellipse. Okay. Now, if h equals zero, s equals g, and a equals b, so z over v is equal to t over two, the zero offset travel time. And the ellipse becomes a circle, as you'd expect, right? And you bring the foci of an ellipse together, you've got a circle. Okay, what about 3D? Okay, so here's our uh, 3D data set, and it's really five dimensional. Uh, notice that what I'm, I'm plotting here is, uh, you know, this is the uh, length of the G location vector. Okay, so we have an origin uh, of our uh, an origin point for our survey on the ground, and G is a vector. It includes, um, you know, it, it might include uh, uh, x and y coordinates. S is a vector. It includes x and y coordinates. So this point here is at some s and g location vector. Okay, so we got a pair of location vectors that uh, um, that. Uh, uh, that identify this one trace. And on that one trace out of the whole data set, there is that 
that one point at time t. Okay, so here's our here's our our map x in the, with its x and y axes, and there's z hanging down, and there's our s location vector, and there's our g location vector, right? And the origin is there. Okay, so uh, if you take the difference between the vectors, okay, g minus s, then that is a vector uh, which um, uh, which would point from s to g. Okay. Well, especially if you if you add it onto s, right? So uh, you take g minus s, and then uh, you know position that vector instead of at the origin, you position it at s. Okay. So you have that vector on the surface there, and you make an ellipsoid of revolution about that that vector s minus g. It's not. It's yeah. It's uh, um, uh, about that line. Okay, starting at s, not starting at the origin. Okay, so um, that uh, uh, that ellipsoid of revolution is um, uh, is the the same locus uh, of all possible reflection points. Um, you know, in this very simple system in in constant velocity, locus of all possible reflection points that could contribute to that reflect that reflection at uh, that time from that source from that receiver. Okay, so uh, we've got to leave it there.